Hello, I'm Sophie Till. This is a series of presentations about the Taubman-Gilansky approach to strings. The presentations form a comprehensive series, but have also been designed to work alone so they can be used in various ways. They address some of the fundamental principles of the approach and show how these principles can provide answers to some of the most commonly asked questions by players of all levels, from professionals to students. The information presented makes most sense when we feel it ourselves, combining knowledge and sensation. There is an immediately recognizable, clear, physical logic to it. While these presentations are not a substitute for hands-on work, they can offer an entry point to this wonderful information. Tools for magic, bow shaping, and in and out. Discussions about the relationship of technique and music are frequent. Playing requires us to use our arms to produce very particular sounds from the instrument. How we use our arms to do this is technique, and the sounds that come out are music. In this sense, they are therefore inseparable. But we have to understand this relationship at a more profound level. The analogy of the magician is helpful. When we watch a magician, we all know that it is illusion. The magician tricks us into momentarily thinking it is magical by knowing exactly what he is doing with his hands. He isn't standing on stage having magical thoughts and hoping we in the audience will get the gist of it. He is controlling what we see and how we see it with skill, knowledge, and precision. It's the same for us as performers. We need to learn and understand what precise physical tools give us specific musical results so we can create and control the magic in the music. Learning all the component parts that will achieve this requires working on certain elements in a very analytical way until they are worked into the system and can be applied in service to the music because the physical tools and the craft of playing have to produce the magic. So the music itself doesn't mean an abandonment of thinking and craft. It means having a toolbox that meets the demands of the music and our imaginations. We've looked at the fundamental principles in the bow arm and in tone production and how the principles of the walking hand and arm can enable us to rethink the foundation for all tone production. Now we're going to look at two elements that control the shape of the sound, color and nuance. The first tool we're going to look at is bow shaping. We often have elements of shaping in our playing instinctively, but understanding it as a comprehensive topic enables us to use it in all aspects of our playing. Bow shaping has many benefits. A dominant activity in the bow arm is changing direction. The bow is, in essence, a straight line. When we go back and forth in straight lines, those changes in direction are abrupt, and we expend a great deal of energy on them. Think about running across a field, back and forth along a straight line. You'd spend a great deal of time and energy turning around each time. On the other hand, if we followed a curvy linear line, creating smooth, gradual curves, the changes in direction will become much less arduous and smoother. It's very clear which one is more efficient. So bow shaping is the use of curvy linear lines, elliptical shapes in combinations of over and under shapes that has a profound impact on the efficiency of the bow arm and our ability to spin out the tone and shape the phrases. We need to be very clear what the over and under shapes are and where they come from. Because we're dealing with a curved bridge and a straight bow, the bow is always on a specific plane according to which string or combination of strings we're playing on. So if I'm on the A string, the plane of the arm is here. For the E string, it will be here. For D, it will be here. And for G, it will be here. It's very helpful to picture these planes so we know what plane the bow shaping relates to. If I take the A string plane, an over shape would look like this. And an under shape would look like this. If I do it without the bow in the air, I can make it larger and it's easier to see. You can see that it would be my forearm making the shape. It is crucial that this movement does not come from the wrist or the hand or the basic alignment of that finger, hand, and forearm unit, which is the foundation for the arm, will be broken. Equally, if the shoulder tries to initiate the movement, it will fatigue immediately. The shoulder always has the role of following the forearm in a perfectly synchronized, proportionate way. 
Of course, all the parts follow with ease, but the engine for the movement is always in the forearm. So on the A string, this will be an overshape. And this will be an undershape. On the string, it will look like this. Here's my undershape on a down bow. And an overshape on an up bow. There are three fundamental principles to shaping that we need to understand it if we are to start to absorb it into our playing as a tool. In another presentation, we looked at the fundamental principle that each movement has to finish and be complete before we can start the next, or one will pollute the next in a cumulative mess. Just as in each step we take in walking, it's complete in order that we can take the next one. This is the same for bow shaping. Each shape starts and ends back at level or in neutral based on the plane that the arm is working on. So this is level and complete at the start and at the finish. This means that the high point or low point is not at the end of the stroke. If I use one shape per bow, the high point or low point will be in the middle of the stroke. It's easy to want to make the high low point at the end of the stroke, but this exacerbates the change in direction. You have to have an imaginary picture of the line or the plane that the arm is on so you can feel where the shape starts and finishes. Here's my imaginary plane for my A string. So I can imagine starting here and finishing here and picture the shape in the middle. The over and under shapes are not owned by the up and down bow direction. We can use over and under shapes in either direction and often use multiple shapes combined in one bow stroke. There are times when we can choose what shapes to use based on what we want musically and times when the nature of the curved bridge and straight bow dictate the shaping when we have to cross the strings. Let's take a basic combination and look at it. The most instinctive shaping is the down bow undershape to an up bow over shape. If you look at the forearm, in particular the underneath part, you can see the arm drawing the elliptical shape. It has to be very shallow or my arm will leave the string. Notice also how each shape starts and ends at a level before continuing on to the next bow shape. So here my arm is level. Here's the low point of the shape. Now I'm back to level where the over shape can begin. Here's the high point of the shape. And the arm coming back down to level again. If the low point or the high point was at the end, you could see how the bow change will be exacerbated. If we go back to my basic under to over combination and give it a tempo, you can start to see how the bow changes become smoothed out by the shaping and I get greater fluidity in the sound. So here's the sound with shaping. And here's the sound with no shaping. If I reverse them and do an over to an under shape, you can see and hear it also. So here's a down bow over shape going to an up bow under shape. It's easiest to start to work with bow shaping in the places where the shapes are dictated for us. This is the case with string crossings. In each of the basic examples we're going to look at, you need to have a picture of what plane the arm is on as we go through the shapes. If we want to go from a low to a high string, the arm has to make an over shape. So if I go from G to D on a down bow or an up bow, 
this will be an over shape. This is the same if I go from D to A in either direction and A to E. If I do them now on the string, you can see them. In the low to high combination, it doesn't matter which part of the bow arm I'm in. The arm needs the over shape to get to the next string. When we move from a higher to a lower string, it will vary depending on where we are in the bow and which direction the arm is traveling in. If I'm in the lower half of the bow, traveling in an up bow direction, the arm will need an over shape to get to the lower string. So from E to A is an over shape. From A to D is an over shape, and D to G if you try and do it with an undershape, the arm feels as if it will crash into the instrument. And so on. If I reverse the bowing, and I'm in the lower half of the bow traveling on a down bow, high to low string, the arm needs to make an undershape to get over easily. It's going to look like this. If I move into the upper half of the bow and I'm traveling in an up bow direction, the arm needs to make an over shape to get from the high to the low strings. If I'm in the upper half of the bow but traveling in a down bow direction, the arm needs to make an under shape to get to the lower strings. This sounds complicated, but once we feel it, it is simple to recognize. So if we now apply this to a simple scale, we can start to see and hear some of the other benefits of bow shaping. If we take a basic detaché stroke on one string, the most instinctive shaping combination is under to over, down to up. If we take a one octave D major scale using the open strings, we can use the same under and over shaping and it will work with the string crossings. Under shape, over shape, under shape, over shape that takes me across the string, under shape, over shape, under shape. If I do it without talking it through, and if I take the shaping out, it sounds like this. So you can hear the difference. It's very clear how the shaping changes the sound, even in a simple example. We can also start to feel some of the other benefits of shaping. If you look at the elbow when the arm is shaping, it has to open and close laterally less than when there is no shaping. The shaping enables me to spin out the sound without extending the arm so far. Here are two versions again, first with the shaping and without the shaping. This time if you look at the elbow, you'll see how much it's opening on both versions. So here it is with shaping. without shaping. I have to use a lot more bow to produce the same amount of sound. So there is an audible and visible change. The sound has a trajectory and the motion is very efficient for the arm when the shaping is present. It's important not to lose the vertical moments that we looked at in tone production. They have to still be there or the arm will be floating. The shaping works with the vertical moments, not instead of them. Now if we change the scale and start on an E, the shaping has to change to accommodate the string crossings in a different place. It would start under, 
then go over. But the G sharp would have to be another over shape in order to get the bow easily over to the open A, which would then be an under shape. The same thing would happen if we had an open E on top. The D sharp here is an over shape taking me to the open E. If we use a fourth finger E, then the under over pattern can be maintained. Under, over, under, over. We can also start to see and hear some of the other benefits if we apply shaping to a different scale. If we take a descending G major two octave scale, we can look at how shaping helps us with the perpetual challenge of the straight bow and curved bridge. As the bow reaches the under shape on the open E, the bow shape includes a change in plane which lands me easily over to the next string. If we continue on the down, on the descending scale, we can use the same under shape again as we go from A to D. So here's the scale descending. Under shape. There's the change in plane. Over shape, under shape, over shape, under shape with a change in plane. There's the change in plane. Under shape, with a change in plane. Here it is without me talking it through. So the under shape with a change in plane is a very useful tool for smoothly getting across from higher to lower strings. The best way to work with shaping is to launch in and do it so the arm gets a feel for it and the ear starts to ask for certain sounds. Let's look at its application in certain, certain examples. The first example is Beethoven's Spring Sonata. When we start training in the shaping, one thing that tends to happen is we get what I call the kid in the candy store syndrome, and we forget that shaping doesn't mean that there aren't any vertical or matale moments. It means that they now fall in a precise spot on the shape. So if we look at the spring sonata opening, we can see that the second shape contains all the 16th notes and will end exactly on the D at the end of the bar which then connects into an undershape on the downbeat of bar two, where we have to always remember that the last note of one shape takes us to the first note of the next shape. So let's have a look at that first bar. There's my undershape on the first note. Here it is again. First undershape, second undershape, with a change in plane, without stopping. This first bar also needs something else. Because the bow is going down bow and we're crossing to the A string, that undershape changes the plane to smooth out the bow change. It's always from the forearm, but this change in plane is common in undershapes that cross from a higher string to a lower string. In bar two, the bow is traveling in an up bow direction, so we need an over shape to cross from the A to the D string notes. Notice that we have two shapes on this second group of sixteenths, an under shape for the first group of sixteenths going to an over shape that ends on the downbeat of bar three. This takes us across the string easily. Here it is. Under shape. Second undershave, overshave, and without talking it through. If I made all the sixteenths one overshave, it would make the high point of the shape feel wrong by putting it between the C and the D. With the two shapes, the overshave puts me over the string at exactly the right point. So here it is with the two shapes again. If I try the one over shape, it sounds and feels wrong. Here it is with one over shape again. 
Bars three, four, and five have the same shaping, starting with an under shape followed by a small under to an oval which gets the bow across the large interval. There's also a shape in the rest. Each one is a tiny over shape but very shallow to bring the arm back where, is, where it's ready for the next down bow. Under shape, under shape, over shape, under shape. Here's the little over shape for the rest. Under shape, over shape, under shape. Here's the rest with the tiny over shape. Under, under, over. Here it is again. We need one additional shape for this, a preparatory shape to start the piece. When we looked at bow fundamentals, we looked at waiting where the bow arm is comfortable. When we are asked, as we often are, or told to, to breathe in order to start, what we really need is momentum in the bow. We aren't wind or brass players after all. So the preparatory shape that sends us to the first note creates the momentum we need to start. So in this case, because the piece starts on the E string with a down bow, we need a small undershape in the up bow direction that propels us into the first vertical moment. It's essential that it sends the arm to a vertical moment and not to the horizontal, or the, the arm will never be down and settled. Here it is being sent to a horizontal moment. And to the vertical. Very often when we see long notes, such as here, we take a gasp of air and try and play the entire note in the first moment. But what we actually need to do is to send ourselves to the first vertical moment, which is the start of the note, not to the whole thing. So this tiny preparatory motion to the first vertical is very stable and comforting. There's no need to guess where or how the note will start. Here it is. Let's look at the second spring sonata example. In the second example, we can see how the shaping helps us with the tone and the string crossings. The phrase starts with an undershape, and then, as is usual in short separate bow passages, the under over format starts on the separate note E flats until the downbeat of the next bar. So under, over, under, over. The first E flat not in the slur is on the up bow, so it gets an over shape in this case. Here's the over shape. Under, over, under, over. In bar 52, the entire bar is an under shape. Because we can feel exactly where the three notes land on the bow shape, we can give them the tone each needs to create the Rin Forzando that's marked in there. Over, under, over, under, over, under, under, under. Then we can allow the end of that undershape to help create the subito piano in the next bar. The end of the undershape helps the sound dissipate, and the overshape in bar 53 enables the piano to comfortably appear. The long undershape on the C leads to an overshape on the ornament, which helps color the ornament and lead the sound into the eighth notes. The eighth notes follow the separate short note rule of under to over, except when the string crossing dictates otherwise. That's why in this case the pattern in both bars is under, over, over, under, to enable the bow arm to cross easily without disturbing the line. Here they are. Under, over, 
under, under, over, under, over. Here it is again. Here's an under shape with a change in plane to get me over to the E. Over. Another over shape because I'm coming back to the A string. Under, under, over because I'm crossing. Under, over. If I tried to keep the under over pattern going regardless of the string crossings, it would feel out of control and clumsy. Here it is. Under, over, under, over, under, over, under. But with the two over shapes, So the two over shapes help smooth it out again. The big under shape on the high F helps create the burst of sound on the Sforzando. Let's go to another example. If we look at the Bruch example, we can see where there are choices that have a musical effect and where we have no choices because of the string crossings. In this case, because the piece starts on the G string, we need a small preparatory over shape to get us from where it's comfortable to wait to the open G string. Here it is. Then we can start with an undershape, which enables us to spin out the sound on that fermata. Because the B flat takes us over to the D string, it needs an overshape, which also helps the color in the sound as we leave that tied G, and it gets the arm exactly to where the D begins. Here it is. The two little eighth notes follow the normal under over pattern, and then we have a choice on the dotted quarter note. Because it's an ad libitum, if we use two shapes, an under on the B flat and then an over on the little eighth note A, we can spin out the drama of the B flat a bit more. That would be like this. Here it is again. But it would also work and have a different effect if we did both notes as an overshape. If I play both versions side by side, you can hear from the beginning how they're different. Here's the two shapes, the two undershapes. And here's one overshape. What is nice about shaping is that once it's in the arm, you can really do what you like in the moment and change the results very easily. The second part of this phrase follows the same pattern with the F sharp to G and as an undershape and the same eighth note pattern leading to the high B flat. Over shape, under, over. The G slurred to the D are interesting because the G needs to sound as the arrival. So an undershape feels better. The little undershape can change planes getting us to the D, which is then a tiny overshape to get us back to the open E string. Here it is. Under, over, under. Here's the change in plane which gets me to the D, and then over. If I put that together. The ascending eights follow the separate bold pattern, but the final two notes give us some choices. It would be possible to play both notes on undershapes, and that would sound like this. But by putting an overshape on the final D, it's easy to make the sound dissolve and connect to the orchestra's entrance. That sounds like this.
So in this example, we can see the combination of shaping choices plus where the string crossings dictate which way the arm needs to go. So bow shaping smooths out bow changes, enables us to spin the trajectory of the sound with minimal effort, and allows us to deal with the straight bow curve bridge combination in a smooth way. But shaping also buys us technical time. When we have to shift or leap, the bow shaping creates a logic to the sound, allowing us to have time to move from place to place while maintaining the line. I often refer to this as creating a technical window within which we can move comfortably. In this block example, there's a large leap in the second bar. We can start shaping the line of the phrase in the previous bar with an undershape on the first triplet slur going to an over and under combination on the separate bow triplet. So undershape, over, under, then on the down beat of the second bar, the undershape spins the sound, enabling me to leap comfortably without disturbing the logic of the line. The top two notes are then an undershape, giving them depth, and then the triplets in the following bar are all undershapes, which helps create the allegando, the last triplet being an over to an under to lead to the final two notes. If that trajectory doesn't make sense in the sound, the left arm will panic in the leap, and it makes it hard to leap. Often in these situations, we try and drag the left arm by using more bow, or in other cases, making the leaping off note so light that the arm is floating rather than leaping. What we want is space to leap with a sound that makes sense with the line of the music. So shaping is essential for creating these technical windows. Let's now look at bow shaping in four note chords. Bow shaping in double stops is a big topic, but looking at it in a four note chord gives us a start as to the application of bow shaping and double stops. So there are in essence two basic ways to shape a four note chord. The tempo and the physical makeup of the chord usually tell us which one to use. A relatively fast four note chord with little sustaining on top will be an overshape. But if the chord needs the top note or the top notes to sing out in a sustained melodic line, then the bow shaping is different. For example, in Bach's G minor adagio, if we look at the opening chord, the top G needs to continue into the tie and then on. We can play the chord as an overshape with an undershape on the top G. This makes the chord pretty fast. Or if we play an undershape on the bottom two, followed by a tiny over in the middle of the stroke to get us over the string crossings, we can then have another shape on the top two notes. This gives the chord more of a rhythmic impact. Here's the first one. And the second one. Of course, there are subtle variations, but the bow shaping enables us to organize the tone. How fast or slow the shapes go will also change the effect of the sound. So if I slow it down, and play the three note chord, it'll sound like this. And faster. If we look at the chords in a different example, we have choices there too. So in this Bartok example, the opening requires a preparatory overshape to get to the G string. The ornaments and the first two notes will be an overshape as the bow arm crosses from G to A string. There are two sixteenths, the two sixteenths are standard under over shapes, but the second half of the bar is an over shape to get us to the E string, followed by another over shape on the last two notes. The final over shape of the bar sends us to the bottom of the chord. The opening requires a preparatory over shape to get to the G string. The ornaments and first two notes will be an over shape as the bow arm gets from the G to the A string. The two sixteenths are standard under over shape. But the second half of the bar is an over shape to get us to the E string, followed by another under. 
over on the last two notes. The final over shape of the bar sends us to the bottom of the chord. The chord itself is an over shape going to an under shape on the top note so I can sing it out enough. The octave is in an over shape that sends us to the bottom of the next chord which due to its speed is just an over shape. The chord in the next bar has time to sing out. So it will be over to an under. The little triplet ornament is an over shape, sending the bow back to the G string. Figure one in the Bartok shows how the shaping really spins the sound out. Both these are under to over, which helps express the accent and the singing tone of the second note. Under to over. Under to over. It's interesting to then take the shaping out and see how the sound changes. So here's that same example without any shaping at all. With the shaping. And now the first version from the beginning of the piece with shaping. So now let's move over to color. One of the biggest color tools we have is the bow's proximity to the bridge or to the fingerboard because it allows us to use the tension or lack of tension in the string. We need to know precisely which movement in the arm enables us to use this feature of the string, bridge, fingerboard relationship. The movement that we need is called in and out. If we recap what we've already discussed in both fundamentals, the holding mechanism, the left-right mechanism, the forearm connecting the bow vertically, we looked at the in and out motions as the movement that deals with bow straightness. In its basic form, it does. But if we use it in combination with bow shaping, we get color and nuance. The in and out movement comes from the back of the elbow. It's the same motion you would use to open or close a drawer. Because the bow works like a lever, the in and out motion is actually defined by where the bow is going on the string. So out is towards the fingerboard, the bow traveling away from the body, and in is towards the bridge, the bow traveling in towards the body. Let's take an example where color is very necessary. In the final movement of Messiaen's quartet for the end of time, we need to be able to control the slow tempo and spin out the sound and the line with inflection. If I just play with the bow shaping as indicated, it sounds like this. motion, in particular on the longer notes, allowing the bow to play in towards the bridge and then out again as the notes taper, I get the nuances without strain and can convey the tenderness in the music. If you look at the bow hair on the string, you can see the in and out working in combination with the bow shapes.
By contrast, if we look at the example from Prokofiev Sonata number no. one, where the tone needs edge and drive, I can use very shallow shapes that spin the sound out in a more intense way, increasing the edge in the sound by using the in and out and allowing the bow to play into the bridge where the moments of maximum intensity are. motion is a wonderful tool to reflect harmonic changes, in particular over long notes and ties where the harmony is shifting underneath, and during long notes in general. Being able to use bow shaping with inflection means we don't have to struggle in long final notes, even when they continue longer than we planned. Here's an example. If we take the end of Bloch's Nagun, we want to reflect the shift in tension that the harmonies create at the start of the final note, and then how the piano chord creates color on the final note itself. By combining the penultimate note with an end towards the bridge, the sound gains tension that can then be released simply in the next undershape by letting the bow move out towards the fingerboard in the undershape. Here it is. On the final note itself, there is tension until the piano releases it with that final chord. We can maintain the tension simply by playing the first undershape into the bridge, and then because it is a long note, we need to spin the sound out further so we can add a second undershape that plays out to the fingerboard and lets that tension go again. Here's that final note. For some reason, the last note needed to be, if for some reason, the last note needed to be even longer, it's necessary to add a tiny new over or under shape at the end to keep it spinning. So the last few inches of bow do not need to sound weak or choked. They can be as expressive as the rest. Let's take an example. Under shape. Second under shape. If I'm going to Extend the note, I'm going to play an over shape, under shape, and finish. Color is essential even in a simple melody. In the Mozart E major adagio, the addition of in and out with the shaping creates all kinds of shadings. When we take the in and out away, the tone is much more straight. So here it is with the in and out motion. And if I take the in and out out, etc. So it's the combination of shaping and in and out that gives us the shading. Bow shaping enables us to play with greater efficiency, expending far less energy and with greater result. In addition, it creates the trajectory to the sound that when worked in combination with the in and out movement, gives us a broad palette of color and shading to use. We have concrete tools to express the magic in the music and once worked into the body, they are ready for use at any time.